what I'll be talking about um, for this session today is uh, focusing in on free jazz. So I'm luck lucky enough through CCJA to have uh, three different sessions here over the next few weeks, um, just trying to go over experimental jazz concepts. So for the session today, I'll be um, discussing aspects of free jazz and free music. Um, so we're just going to dive right in talking about the free jazz, which is Ornette Coleman's album, uh, Free Jazz, a collective improvisation for a double quartet. Um, so terminology stuff real quick, what is free jazz? Uh, so free jazz in the classic sense is improvised free music uh, that is free from preset chord changes, free from traditional and conventional jazz practices, free from meter and tempo. Um, so what that means is with chord changes, you could have a piece like um, George Gershwin's Rhythm Changes, which follows an AABA form and has a certain kind of structure and harmony that's preset that after the melody and head statement is played, improvisers would play that same structure and chord progression, chorus after chorus after chorus, 32 bars, repeating that over and over again. So in the classic definition of free jazz, um, we're getting away from having these preset chord changes and just going into something else, kind of whatever happens, happens. Um, free from traditional and conventional jazz practices. So this could be simple things like getting away from the melody, solos, melody, structure of a composition. This could be getting away from jazz forms, from uh, jazz swing feel, um, getting away from bebop language or blues language, but basically taking things that we've taken for granted that are traditional and conventional jazz practices and trying to do different things or cast these things aside or go into new directions. Um, free from meter and tempo is getting away from the idea of playing um, something that you can tap your fingers along to or tap your foot along to and getting into free time or time that's not pulsed, time that's out of tempo. So what's funny about all of this um, definition of what we know of as the genre of free jazz and that terminology is that it's comes from this uh, record of Ornette Coleman's from 1961 titled Free Jazz, which actually uh, has quite a bit of conventional jazz practice to it. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of audio here in a minute and actually show you a transcription score that I put together. So unlike the definition that I just gave of free jazz, the Ornette Coleman album actually has quite a bit of form structure and composition to it. Um, so the original recording features a double quartet of um, two horn players on both quartets, uh, two bass players and two drummers. So um, the form and structure of the piece features an in-head melody statement uh, solo and then interlude solo, interlude solo, interlude solo, and it follows the structure throughout the whole piece. And using conventional jazz practices, it goes through all four of the horn solos first, then the bass solos, then the drum solos, which is just the standard traditional jazz practice of like a solo form going down in like a score order. Um, as these solos occur, um, there's these composed interludes that happen between them. Sometimes they're melodic figures, sometimes they're some kind of held long tone chords. Um, one of the most famous melodic materials that's within this piece is this melody that happens about in the middle of the composition. Um, um, so even though, again, this piece is free jazz, and this is where the term free jazz comes from, again, there's a lot of composition and conventional jazz practice to this. Um, so with all the different horn solos, um, like trad jazz, there is this option where during the horn solos individually, other horn players in the band actually do start accompanying and playing background figures along with the solos, um, which isn't a new thing to jazz music. Um, this is a popular thing with trad jazz and Dixieland jazz, but is featured, you know, on this record. Um, 
the everything is fairly in meter and in tempo. Uh, one drummer and one bass player plays a medium tempo swing throughout almost the entire piece. The other rhythm section plays a double time swing feel uh, along with that. And so as you're listening to this, it's something you very much can, you know, uh, 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 stomp your feet or, you know, uh, snap your fingers along with. So um, there is this sort of conundrum that we have this genre called free jazz, but at least the album that the term comes from actually does feature quite a bit of conventional jazz practices, um, as well as if one were to go back and listen um, and transcribe solos um, from these recordings, you probably would find a lot of blues and bebop language, as well as things that are implying different harmonic structures um, so just kind of starting off here with this sort of paradox of what is free jazz, what is its terminology commonly known as, and then the album that this comes from, which actually is kind of <laughs> not all that free at the end of the day. So I'm going to play a, just the, a little bit of the beginning here and show you this uh, score transcription I have. I think you can see this. Let me just pull it over here. Um, so this is actually an arrangement I made. So basically these electric guitar parts in the score are actually the trumpet parts and the tenor sax line is Eric Dolphy's bass clarinet line. So I'm just going to play a little bit at the beginning and try to kind of follow the score along with it. Um, but just kind of listen for, you know, some of these more conventional jazz practices that are within the piece. Yeah, so I just wanted to play a little bit of that just to, again, just kind of bring home this point that um, with talking about free jazz and talking about the terminology and this kind of music, um, there's a lot more to it than just the idea of anything goes, you can just play what you want, it's all just improvised. Um, and then um, I specifically titled these sessions I'm doing for CCJA um, Experimental Jazz Concepts because I also have run into especially... Um, uh, a lot of different New York musicians um, uh, uh, who seem to really take umbrage with the terminology free jazz. And I think this is similar in its own way to like um, how Youssef Latif and older musicians view the term jazz and, and don't really like using that kind of loaded terminology. So um, Youssef Latif would call um, um, his music audio physio psychic music. Um, because of not liking the term jazz and, and some of its maybe negative connotations. So similarly, I've come across other musicians who don't like using the term free jazz. And so for me, trying to find a little bit more of a neutral term for some of this kind of adventurous music um, coming from like the, the early 1960s and on into today, I, I think maybe experimental jazz is a little bit more of a, a neutral and broader term that can mean, you know, different jazz that people are trying to experiment with new ideas on. Um, so that kind of goes into this next thing with um, terminology. So um, the avant-garde is another name that people have referred to this music as, which uh, is just French for the advance guard or part of the army that marched in front. Um, this was this was used a lot um, and still is to this day in other fields of um, visual art and theater um, and film, but just, you know, different uh, terminology for this kind of more advanced um, future looking sort of creative activity. Um, like I mentioned, experimental jazz is kind of a term that I like to use, but there's also the new thing, um, free improvisation, which kind of... Um, isn't always uh, uh, jazz related, but in a Venn diagram has overlap with, with jazz. Uh, and then luckily uh, about a year ago, I was, I was fortunate enough to work with um, soprano saxophonist, Sam Newsom. And he was telling me about how he likes to talk about some of this music as the traditionalists versus the modernists versus the experimentalists. And um, I know as I'm trying to get through a lot of stuff today, I'm going to be kind of brief here. But basically, the the idea that um, in simplistic terms, there's three kinds of musicians like within jazz where you have traditionalists. And this could be as simple as um, 
like a college big band doing um, Duke Ellington uh, transcriptions note for note and trying to play as stylistically accurate as possible to, you know, old um, Duke Ellington big band um, style of playing and recordings and arrangements. So basically a, a version of kind of like a museum music of doing something from the past um, like it has been done before and, and not with any kind of negative connotations there, but just the idea of really trying to do the tradition like the tradition, you know, was played. Um, modernists would be people that kind of have a foot in both the past and the future. So there's a little bit of the traditionalist there, but there's also a little bit of the experimentalist there. Um, and just trying to come up with people who might fit in this category. This could be potentially people that are on the cover of Downbeat magazine, um, people like Donnie McCaslin or Kurt Rosenwinkel, um, musicians that are playing original music in original ways, but then also perfectly happy to play great American songbook jazz, um, even though they're very much making it their own. So kind of like modernists are sort of, you know, a little bit in the past, a little bit in the future and kind of mix of things. And then the experimentalists, um, are the ones that are kind of on the very forefront of doing things um, that are not wi widely accepted at all and sometimes actually would get quite a bit of flack for trying these kind of new and experimental things in, in their own new ways. Um, so the idea with experimentalism is to do things that have never been done before um, and because it's hard to create any, any kind of art or music in a vacuum, sometimes there is obvious um, roots in, in various traditions. Um, so one good example of this could be someone like Cecil Taylor, who um, was getting like a lot of press and a lot of articles written about him in the 1960s, but at some points was um, only, you know, playing two or three gigs a year and having to supplement his income by, you know, being a, a dishwasher. Uh, and then still, get it, once he got older and more established and, and got more um, credence, was still then, you know, disrespected in the 1980s with the Ken Burns jazz documentary. Um, so there's an aspect to some of experimentalism that will always kind of rub certain people the wrong way. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, again, talk about that terminology because I think it's an interesting way to look at music. Um, even though, you know, these aren't hard and fast rules at all, and that there's a lot of overlap between these three different approaches. Um, so just talking about some quick uh, qualities here. So this is more kind of referring to, I guess, horn players, but some of these qualities of playing this music would include um, extensive manipulation of pitch and tone quality, altissimo vocal sounds, like singing and screaming into a horn, um, use of multiphonics, um, extended technique. Um, so this is, in my opinion, kind of coming out of like the school of like Albert Eiler, um, the great tenor saxophonist, as well as John Gilmore, who was um, Sun Ra's uh, primary tenor saxophonist um, for the Sun Ra or Orchestra. Um, so this is kind of the idea of taking the saxophone into more of a world of creating sound and creating noises. And it's not um, uh, wholly unique to the saxophone as well as um, trumpet and trombone and woodwinds and other instruments were experimenting with some of these same ideas. Um, and this gets into the idea of playing this music where texture becomes uh, emphasized over melody and um, at least an example with Cecil Taylor or some of the late era John Coltrane, you're getting into this fast, loud, dense music that occurs for very long periods of time. So you're almost entering um, a new realm of music making that's almost more ritualistic uh, than it is about um, some of the things that were emphasized before this with making the changes or um, you know, playing certain tempos or, or executing things with certain kinds of bebop related um, idioms or, or precision. And then as far as the melodic language, um, a lot of musicians within this were getting away from using strictly bebop language. And in the way of somebody like Albert Eiler, they actually were simplifying the language and using a lot more diatonic um, based melodic material 
um, or like Cecil Taylor, or late era John Coltrane, going the other direction and getting super chromatic, um, where there were no real identifiable um, key centers. Um, I, I've noticed at least with Cecil and Coltrane, I've found things where at least there's usually a root. Um, so maybe there's a pedal point or a shifting pedal point, but still no real clear consensus of is this major or minor or what kind of tonality it is other than this is in A flat, A flat something. Um, so with some of this music as well, then there's also this idea of no recognizable pulse or beat. And it's just kind of this freer textural idea of tempo um, that's kind of a slow or a fast sort of rubato, speeding up, slowing down, or, or just sounds being sounds. Um, real quickly, just going through a couple um, specific instrument roles. So with the piano, there becomes um, less traditional harmony and chord progressions. Um, so getting away from, uh, 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 yeah, following just set harmony like jazz piano normally does, uh, getting into more chromatic clusters. And I just wanted to mention something that reminds me of this so much is um, I read this book on uh, Charles Ives memoirs years ago, and he actually talked about when he was younger, how he would practice um, percussion parts for marching band on piano with the marching band. And he noticed very early on, he couldn't really play chords like traditional chords because they would clash with the notes that the wind instruments were playing in the marching band. So at the time he ended up devising these um, very non-harmonic sounding clusters at the high and the low register of the piano. So he could practice essentially the bass drum and the snare drum part on piano uh, in marching band, but not play anything that would sound harmonically conflicting with the marching band. And so I've always been curious about like what those tone clusters were and what those would sound like. Um, but yeah, playing an idea like that, uh, percussive rhythmic sounds, textures, and then Cecil Taylor would refer to the piano as 88 tuned drums, which is another kind of more African approach to um, playing the piano in this music. Um, there's also a long history of playing inside the strings of the piano. Um, so Keith Jarrett and Paul Blay are both great examples of uh, pianists who would open up the piano and, and try to do things with um, slides and plectrums and plucking the strings just to get different sounds. I know there's a great video on YouTube of uh, Keith Jarrett playing with the Charles Lloyd Quartet, and he has like a metal plectrum on the strings of the piano that he's playing to accompany Charles Lloyd. Um, one of the first people I know who really was doing this was the classical composer Henry Cowell. Uh, I think one of his pieces was Banshee that used some of these inside the piano um, ideas. Um, but yeah, in general, it's just using the entire register of the piano, using extreme highs, extreme lows. Uh, I think that's something especially Cecil Taylor, for one, is really well known uh, uh, of using um, that incredibly low end of the piano that you just don't hear a lot with um, traditional jazz music. Um, so yeah, moving on here, um, for those who don't know, that's a picture of the bass player William Parker on the right. Um, really fantastic bassist in this music who um, passed away in the last few years. But some things the bass players were doing, uh, breaking away from the jazz walking quarter note and getting into broken bass playing or kind of playing more rhythmically fragmented um, things that... Um, weren't as consistent or, or hard to maybe predict or, or analyze. Um, also, bass players were going into playing more vamps and ostinatos or rhythmic repeated material, so they could maybe repetitively play some kind of a bass figure while everything else sonically around them was kind of sounding like it was falling apart or, or rising or building. Um, um, so and there's a lot of great examples, especially of 1960s um, um, avant-garde jazz that kind of does this. Um, freer counterpoint, conversational. Um, even though not a free jazz musician, um, it's interesting that a lot of the bass players of Bill Evans 
very much were part of this um, new kind of avant-garde approach and sound. And so both uh, Gary Peacock played with Albert Eiler, Scott LaFaro played with Ornette Coleman. They're some of the first bass players in this music to really start playing like um, lines as if they were horn players, but on the bass as a way to approach this kind of freer music. Um, Charlie Hayden, use of drones, uh, so he would play a lot of octaves, a lot of double stops with two notes at once. Uh, there's a really great bassist, not as well known, Alan Silva, who would use a lot of arco playing and bowing harmonics. Um, and then the great Jimmy Garrison with all of his open and unaccompanied bass solos with John Coltrane, um, just as another great approach to, to playing this music. Um, so I'm kind of listing all these people off as just an example of some people to listen to to come up with sort of these gestures and ideas. Um, getting into the drummer. And then very soon I'm going to get into actually how can you practice and work on this. I just want to get through one more here. That's a picture of the great drummer Milford Graves on the right. Uh, he also passed away recently, but um, played quite a bit with um, uh, uh, Albert Eiler, among many others. So the drummer is now not always the timekeeper, going into a territory of um, creating sounds, densities, and colors instead of just being responsible for the time feel. Uh, a lot of extra percussion was getting added into the music, a lot of extended techniques. Uh, there's a really great interview from a few years back with Sonny Murray, who was one of um, Albert Eiler's drummers, and he actually talks about um, how he would check out books from the library on the physics of sound and the acoustics of sound, and he would basically try to learn as much as he could about the science of sound waves and sound production so that he could find new ways to approach the drum set and basically create a new world of sound approaches just coming from science and different ways you can trick the ear into hearing different frequency responses. Um, and then with a drummer like Milford Graves bringing a lot of world music approaches into um, the music. One of the more interesting things with Milford that I remember reading is how um, from his studies of um, biology, biology and um, uh, basically the human heart was he felt that um, the heartbeat beats in a triple rhythm. And so for him to align with the human spirit and body, everything he played had to be related to a triple meter because to him, duple meter went against your heartbeat. Um, so from a very early point in his um, musical career, he always advocated this triple, you know, um, and you could look at it as the jazz swung triplet or, or Afro-Cuban music or however you want, but basically the triple meter being more aligned with how the heart works and the duple meter going against that. And then even though this was happening in the 20th century, come the 21st century, um, drummers also started adding in electronics and kind of more non-standardized objects like wine glasses, dowel rods, styrofoam, balloons, kind of, you know, taking a trip to the hardware store and uh, seeing what sounds good or what different ways you could approach the drums from. So now we're getting into some very specific stuff with things you can work on and practice. So uh, there's a great blog uh, called The Cruise Ship Drummer, who um, did an interview thing with Han Benick, uh, who's the drummer here featured on the right. And so I tried to kind of paraphrase some things from the interview to make it more applicable to musicians outside of just drummers. Um, but originally this was all written for, for people playing drum set, even though I think it's highly applicable across the board. So some different ways to approach trying to play this more freer open music. One of the first things, uh, play as fast as you can for five minutes without repeating yourself. Um, so basically this is getting into a big part of what I'm gonna be talking about today is this idea of parameters. So playing as fast as you can for five minutes without repetition, playing as slow as you can for five minutes without rep repetition, playing as loud, as soft, and just any of these kind of things you can do of how you can approach playing five minutes of music with no repetition, and then going through these set parameters of different ways you can approach that. Um, another one is 
uh, as this was applicable to drum set, uh, something like playing one of your drums or playing one of your cymbals for five minutes, trying to keep it instrument uh, or trying to keep it interesting. Um, so limiting the area of your instrument. So if you're a guitar player, only playing one string for five minutes. If you're a piano player, maybe only playing a uh, left-handed piano within a certain register of the, the instrument. If you're a horn player, only playing within, you know, maybe a perfect fifth or uh, less than an octave of your instrument, but just trying to give yourself a very specific section of your instrument where you can only play in that area for five minutes. And again, trying to keep it musical, keep it interesting, and then rotating this around however long, if it's the same day or the same week, until you've eventually done this through your entire instrument's range or capability. Um, just to kind of see what happens when you limit limit what you're bringing into it. Um, another one, repeat the same idea for five minutes, try to keep it interesting. So drummer specific, it was um, repeat the same groove for five minutes. Uh, if you're, you know, a rhythm section player, maybe there's some kind of a vamp or an ostinato you can play for five minutes. Uh, maybe if you're a horn player, there's a melody that you can repeat for five minutes over and over again, but just trying to figure out how you can create some kind of an idea and just keep doing it and keep it interesting. Um, play a five minute crescendo ending as loud as possible. Uh, so this is physically pretty fun. Um, this also, I think, gets into a bigger idea, not only of dynamically, but thinking about the macro idea of music, where you're trying to create something that is going to last over the span of five minutes long. So for instance, with something like a crescendo, or if you did the opposite, a day crescendo, thinking that you have to pace this for five minutes and it's such a, a basic musical idea that you have to do it very, very slowly. So if you're doing a five minute crescendo, the first minute might be just barely audible. And then the second, third and fourth minute, it's supposed to continue to grow, but you can't grow so fast that you run out of space. Um, so it actually would probably take multiple times over to practice an idea like that until you can really get as loud as possible and stay there. Uh, and then also it gives you this idea too of, okay, well, you know what your dynamics are, but then musically, what are you playing to get there? Uh, which, you know, gives you something else to kind of think about. Um, and again, a little more drummer specific, but play solid time for five minutes, check in with a metronome before or after. Uh, and again, I think there's there's plenty of exercises you can do no matter what your instrument is to play something with the same tempo or time feel uh, for five minutes, checking whatever the metronome marking is before and after you start to kind of see if you're in the ballpark. Um, and then as you know, the opposite of that, play completely free of time for five minutes, no kind of pulsed way, but just trying to play outside of time. Um, and again, create music and create something that's interesting and musical to listen to. Um, so this is one of the best, just very quick resources I've found for just a good steady, you know, five minute exercises to work on playing this more open and freer music um, just in the practice room. And then if you take, you know, those, uh, I guess, six different ideas and then try to combine them in different ways, try to add some new things to it. I mean, you could kind of get endless com uh, combinations of, of different ways to um create new exercises. Uh, so this is a, a little more intensive, but um, a lot of information here. So just some other um, practice tips. Basically, I, I always say if anyone is very interested in playing this more freer and open music, one of the best ways is to just start off by listening to it. Um, I think sometimes there's sort of a weird um, aesthetic that some people get into where, um, which I don't uh, think is, is true, where they think um, there's something radically different about playing free or open music that's different from playing bebop or traditional jazz. And to me, it's a tradition that's, you know, just as old as a lot of, you know, 
whatever 1940s 1950s bebop uh you know uh uh and to me, it requires the same level of kind of serious study and listening to um, where, you know, you can listen to um, Charlie Parker playing Yardbird Suite, you can listen to uh, uh, Kind of Blue, and you can listen to Ornette Coleman, uh, Shape of Jazz to Come. Uh, so anyway, so I just think there's a lot to really just getting these sounds in your ears and hearing what's happening. So as you start to listen to some of these recordings, um, playing along with them, again, similar to how you would approach like learning jazz standards, play along with recordings, uh, both imitate what you're hearing, but then also try to complement and accompany what you're hearing. Um, and one of the best ways I think to do that, if you're not trying to specifically imitate something, is try to listen along and um, fit in with the recording as if you're um, one of the musicians in the ensemble. Um, then I think, you know, once you've done this a, a, a few times, then it's not a bad idea to actually just go ahead and record yourself playing along with some of these recordings and listen back and kind of take notes and figure uh, if the sounds that you're hearing and thinking are coming out the way you want are actually coming out that way. Um, and some of this idea comes from this interview I found from the great Ken Vandermark, who's a wonderful Chicago multi-instrumentalist, um, saxophone clarinetist, where he talks about being in college um, back in the 80s, and he would play along to Cecil Taylor records to basically learn how to play this music. So he would put on a, you know, vinyl of Cecil Taylor playing solo piano. And he would say when he first did it, he could barely get through a 20 minute side of an LP playing with Cecil Taylor because he would get physically exhausted, as well as he would just run out of ideas to play on his saxophone. Um, so he just kind of had to keep doing it over and over again to figure out how to hang with this music and how to keep up with that level of intensity and energy. Um, so then that goes into um, listen specifically to recordings of musicians who play your instrument within this music, um, taking notes of different gestures, extended techniques, sounds and ideas, um, even, you know, potentially going as far as transcribing some bits of things that you're hearing that you like and kind of working it out on your instrument. And then, of course, going the next step and doing this with um, musicians who don't play your instrument and trying to apply those same sounds and ideas um, and again, a, a lot of this isn't new information. Uh, it's exactly how we approach playing jazz standards and bebop music. It's just, it's it's equally as valid, I think, in, in learning this kind of music as well. Um, I'd written out a little note about Joe Morris. Uh, he talked about when he was younger as a um, guitar player, he would transcribe um, the saxophonist John Chakai, who's one of the saxophonists on John Coltrane's Ascension, and um, uh, John Shakai had this sort of circular, circuitous way of playing the alto saxophone where um, Joe Morris really sonically um, really enjoyed that. And so he, he started transcribing some of these circular gestures and patterns, but on guitar. And from that kind of cross transfer from the saxophone to, to guitar, he basically developed his own language and style of guitar playing, which changed very radically from changing from instrument to instrument. Um, so I always think about that, thinking about trying to get ideas from another instrumentalist, and you never know, you know, what you're going to find. And then um, once you're kind of also getting out of just the practice room, um, get together with other like-minded musicians and um, try to, you know, try some of these things out. Um, so part of that uh, uh, is getting together and actually talking about um, parameters before you play, or at least that's one way you can approach it. So um, get together with a jazz combo and say, you know, let's do a free bop tune or, you know, playing with a time feel, but with no chord changes. So, you know, it's going to swing, it's going to be in tempo. Maybe there still is going to be four bar, eight bar phrases, but leaving everything else harmonically kind of open. And then after you, after you do that, um, try playing only using very abstract and fragmented sounds and noises and phrases. 
uh, go in trying to play very loud and dense, kind of like these Coltrane, Cecil Taylor sort of approaches. Um, and then again, try to do the opposite, play super quiet and super sparse, but um, kind of have this conversation with musicians and try these different things out as a group and try to really connect and play with one another. Um, I think that really helps kind of talking about the specificity of what you want to try to do. Um, and then again, once you've done this enough and once you've kind of gotten comfortable with this with some other musicians, then I think it opens it up more to um, get to the point where you can just get out your instruments and just play without um, talking about it. Because um, obviously that's a, a really nice thing to be able to do as well is just opening up your cases, not saying anything, and then just playing and seeing what happens and just trying to communicate sonically instead of verbally. Um, one of my friends said years ago, he used to do trio sessions with Tony Malaby just for fun. And one of the things they would actually do is um, they would pick a musician in the trio and the idea was they would focus on playing off of that one musician, even though no one was the soloist and all three musicians were playing at the same time. So having a collective improvisation, but there's one musician that everyone's listening to and playing off of who's kind of leading the musical gestures. Um, which it's kind of a tricky concept because of, it's almost the idea of you're following a soloist but they aren't actually soloing. So like, again, trying to uh, move it over to like jazz standards. Imagine you're playing all the things you are, no one's soloing, but everyone's just trying to play off of the drummer. So they're trying to get their ideas from the drummer and create music and play music, but the drummer isn't soloing and no one else in the band is soloing. Um, but again, doing that and, and travel around the, the band. Okay, try it now with the bass player, try it now with the saxophone player, and just to have that one person to focus on. Um, and then um, something that's a little bit more recent that I've been actually trying out is there's a really fantastic trio with Ellery Escalin, who's a wonderful New York tenor saxophonist where he started having these sessions with Gary Versace on organ. And this led to basically starting this organ trio where they would play essentially these sort of freely improvised versions of jazz standards. So the idea is, um, say you would get together with a group of musicians, pick a jazz standard that everyone knows really, really well, you know, no one has to read sheet music for, and you would just freely improvise knowing that eventually you're going to get into playing this jazz standard and whatever happens, happens. So uh, by the time you actually get into the jazz standard, you could be playing rubato without chord changes, loosely playing the melody, or you could get 100% into strictly playing the tune in time, swinging very precise, very accurately, or kind of anything in the middle and then once you actually play the head statement of the jazz standard, where do you go from there? Do you um, continue to play over the solo form? Do you play free bop, you know, time, no chord changes? Do you go back into playing totally free? Uh, do you hint at the melody? Um, so it's kind of this idea of you're trying to incorporate playing open and free, but you're also still trying to play a jazz standard in an identifiable way. And, um, I feel like with the same group of musicians, you could try this 10 different times and all 10 times it could turn out radically different. Um, and then with a tune like All the Things You Are, you also have this intro outro that's part of the tune where that could also become its own thing unto itself. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, this is a very interesting exercise. I've only done this a handful of times with musicians, but it always um, turns out incredibly musical. And especially with musicians who are coming from more of a jazz or bebop background, it's a really interesting meeting ground between playing um, freer or open music and trying to kind of combine that with the world of, of bebop and standards playing. Um, so again, another just great exercise and thing to try out with some other musicians. Um, I'm not really going to say much here, 
but I just wanted to show a couple just quick graphic scores. I'm probably going to be talking about this more um, next week uh, uh, as I get into more contemporary classical music and how it affects this music. But above there is a um, Anthony Braxton score excerpt. So not only are there some really interesting rhythmic devices with these uh, six over one, seven over one, 11 over two, uh, five over one, you know, these different rhythmic things happening, but then there's all these graphic um, things with the notes being different colors, certain things being circled, triangles, squares, uh, circles. If you also look at it, the score involves a diamond clef. And uh, diamond clef just means read it in your own transposition. So if you want to read it in treble clef, you can read it in bass clef, tenor, alto clef. You can read it in any transposition. So a B flat instrument can read it in their transposition. So basically, if you're playing this with a group of musicians, it creates improvised harmony depending on what clefs and transpositions everyone's reading it in. Um, but just an interesting example of what you can do with some graphics. And then um, Cecil Taylor, as far as I know, never used any kind of manuscript paper or traditional staffs when he wrote music. So the bottom graphic is an excerpt from one of his scores that was shown at a uh, Whitney Art Gallery um, showing an, an exhibit a few years back. I'm not exactly sure which um, piece that is, but you can kind of get a sense of what some of his music looked like. Um, because a lot of his music was fairly specifically composed, even if it doesn't maybe sound like that on um, recordings. Yeah, that was probably the last time I did the free jazz standards. It was so cool because like, I, I remember you like you guys had a list of what my of like tunes that might happen and you guys didn't even decide on the tune. It was like, you guys just kind of did something and then whatever tune came out of that list like came out it was really cool that was like one of my favorite things yeah 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 i think we did the parameter of like the, we had maybe a list of five or six tunes and in a 45 minute set we were only going to play those five or six tunes but so so that that was even more open-ended because everybody's waiting for like softly as in a morning sunrise or stella and kind of waiting for someone to hint at one of the melodies and then occasionally like you know you get two tunes happening at the same time because you wasn't you weren't sure which one people were going for oh it was so cool as an audience member also to like try to anticipate what tune was coming it was really cool yeah thank you so yeah, I'm just going to talk about a few just compositions here, and I might skip around of uh, this list because I have a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, but when we get to these kind of ideas of free jazz compositions, um, I think one of the most important things, as well as studying and transcribing some of this music, but the idea of also just composing your own music, uh, try some stuff with some just diatonic folk kind of singable melodies, but then also maybe try some stuff that are fully 12 tone chromatic um, and just everything in the middle just to, you know, get some new sounds. Um, I remember just a quick analogy or, or anecdote, um, Dave Douglas talking about uh, trying to figure out how to play 12 tone music on his trumpet and asking, um, you know, different musicians, how they did it and developed like a fully kind of 12 tone language to playing. And the response was, oh yeah, we'll just write some tunes, you know, write some melodies that do that, write some compositions that do that. And the more you do that, the more that will come second nature to improvising like that. So kind of same thing with this music, the more music you write in the style and play it, the more those sounds will kind of come out when you improvise. Um, so uh, I'm probably not going to play the recording right now, but um, Ascension is something I've had a lot of luck with playing with different ensembles over the years and student ensembles particularly. So to try to continue to demystify some of this classic music, um, uh, Ascension, especially if you go back and check out one of the live um, uh, classic quartet recordings of Ascension, it's a little bit harder to find, but it does exist. Uh, but Ascension is all it is at the end of the day is a B flat minor blues. Um, it sounds as weird as it does because it has like a uh, flat six, five turnaround. And so if you have a group of 12 musicians 
who are playing this rubato not together and half of the musicians go to the flat six chord before the other half you get a really jarring sound so uh, that's why it sounds as weird or as out as it does is because you know uh, g flat seven and b flat minor have some pretty different uh, <laughs> clashing notes against one another and then from doing some research on ascension um, how they did this in the studio, um, Coltrane actually had a, a list of four or five note pitch sets that were written out for the musicians. So just like the tune uh, or for the composition Free Jazz from earlier, the Ornette composition, um, this also features a head interlude solo, interlude solo, interlude solo style form. But in the studio, Coltrane would hold up uh, uh, some of his fingers for the interludes. So he would say, you know, hold up the number three and the band would play pitch set number three for that, you know, 30 second interlude to jump off into the next soloist. Um, so even though you could listen to this recording and say it sounds super free and super out, there actually is quite a bit of um, form and structure to this. Um, I was actually lucky enough to do this with some CU musicians about a month ago. And um, with about five minutes of rehearsal, we ended up playing like a 45 minute version of it. Uh, and it was just incredibly musical and fun and easy for people to kind of latch on to. Um, and then with these cued pitch sets, it gives quite a bit of um, common sounds for people to latch on to and kind of play together. So uh, Ornette Coleman Free, uh, um, this is an AABA tune. Uh, one of the things I found fascinating doing some Ornette Coleman research is that one of the things that got him into free music is actually the idea of rhythm changes. And so when he was learning how to play jazz and bebop, he thought the bridge to rhythm changes was so jarring and that the bridge was usually improvised that that was his epiphany for basically playing free bop or, or free jazz or time no changes was the idea that you're moving radically and all of a sudden from one key center to another B flat major to D7. Um, and that then once you got to D7, you could just make up the notes and play whatever you wanted that that gave him the idea for his freer compositions of playing the melody and then just playing whatever you wanted after the melody statement. And so this tune free still follows this AABA structure with a drum solo as the B section instead of like a typical B section. Um, uh, I'm kind of run out of time here because I have too much info here, but just a quick sketch of then after they play the head statement, they kind of go into this three over four up tempo hemiola pulse that sort of jumps off into the saxophone solo, which is this free free bop, no changes sax solo. Uh, the bass eventually breaks away and starts playing a broken figure while the drums keep time. And then there's this kind of complete just breakdown where the drums stop playing, the bass is playing really sparsely, and the saxophone and trumpet between Ornette Coleman and Don Cherry start kind of trading phrases back and forth. And then that kind of jumps off into the trumpet solo, which gets back into drums playing time. Um, so kind of, um, I bring this up because this is just like a really good way, I think, to focus and study and research this music is, um, even if you don't have lead sheets of it, uh, like, you know, I have a lead sheet of this, this tune, um, just listening to like one five or six minute tune by one of these musicians and artists and writing down a sketch of what you're hearing form wise, how they accompany the solos, if they're solos, how they go between solos, um, and it's just kind of, it's like listening to big band music or listening to bebop, just getting a, a, an awareness of what's been done and what different possibilities are out there for playing this music. This is kind of a game sort of piece I put together based on Albert Eiler's music. I did some transcriptions of his a long time ago. And after doing a bunch of transcriptions, I realized a lot of these tunes were really like simple melodic hooks, sometimes only two or four measures long. And so I kind of created this sort of cued game 
where um, I put a handful of these uh, melodic sketches together so that basically each theme could be cued with uh, musicians in the band. And then you could freely improvise in between the cueing. So uh, one way I would do this was get a group together, play through each um, section in rehearsal just to make sure everyone has a general feel of, of how these sound and how they're played. And then once everything's been played through, then try to actually do kind of a performance of it where you can play these in any order, any repetition, any number of open repeats, and then improvise sort of trying to connect the glue between these different feels. Um, and then, yeah, just I highly recommend checking out Albert, Albert Eiler's music as it was a more diatonic approach, uh, a lot of multiphonics and overblown sounds, altissimo sounds, bass arco, uh, different things happening there. And then really quickly, just to wrap up, so know the musicians you were playing with. Um, one free or freer approach or more open approach doesn't always fit with every musician. Um, some people are going to be more closer to the traditional jazz spectrum of free jazz. Some people are not going to want to quote any kind of jazz conventions and are just going to want to, you know, make noises on bowed styrofoam and uh, bleep blop bloops on a computer and all of that's super cool but just basically know the environment that you're going into and make sure that you're playing musically appropriate and then that goes into also within that um, thinking about the mood of the composition and how the improvisation connects with that so if you're playing kind of a slower moody melodic composition maybe making sure that your improv follows that same kind of moody melodic feel. Um, and then same goes with genre. You know, if something is play the head in a straight ahead swing time kind of feel, maybe that's appropriate for the improv. Um, maybe it's not, but at least being aware of that, which also gets into, you know, just being aware of how the composition and the improvisation connect, playing off of the composition as material for your improvisation or against it because with all these rules, anything can be broken. But the idea at the end of the day is that you're using your intention and you're making intentional choices. So if you think intentionally, it's a great idea after you play a certain kind of a melody to just go into like loud, crazy noises, that's great. But just know that like that's a choice you're making and there's many choices you can make in interpretation and how you improvise. Um, and again, this is kind of connected, um, but I have like a selected kind of bi bibliography and discography if you want to dive deeper into this music. Um, some of these are relevant to um, what I'm going to be doing um, next week with contemporary classical music, um, but I'll repost the same bibliography discography next week. Um, just some different recordings and things to check out. And I think I pretty much got through about everything I wanted to today here. I was going to ask maybe, maybe very quickly, if you could, if you have any advice for listeners who are new to this music and don't know how to, how to listen to it and how to like get into appreciating what's happening, because sometimes it can sound like so much is happening at once. Do you have any advice for listeners? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is one of the things that this is why I got into it at, a, at an earlier age was that I love the idea of problem solving. And so to me, I mean, I'm not a chess player, but that that's the kind of almost analogy I would think is like, listen to it and try to start figuring out patterns. Like, because to me, that's how I really enjoyed and appreciated is figuring out like, Oh, okay, this might sound chaotic, this might sound crazy, but what's what's being repeated? Or like, you know, what's the drummer doing? What's the bass player doing? Single out instruments, single out textures. If there's some radical or sudden change from one thing to another, try to like figure out what that is. Um, but to me, that's the key word that I, I always like is the idea of problem solving and how you can listen to this music and, um, try to yeah put put your detective hat on and figure out like how are they doing this or or what is what is guiding them to do xyz mm -hmm. 
It's really cool. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to next week. We're looking at more contemporary classical stuff next week. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And and I guarantee, especially since it's CCJA, a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about next week is going to be very new to a lot of people. But I'm very excited about it because it'll all tie in, but in a totally different way.